The Cape Cod National Seashore, a pristine stretch of New England coastline for those who have sought to experience, as James McConnell noted, an extraordinary spiritually charged natural environment. One of those seekers was nature writer Henry Beston, who in 1928 wrote the classic The Outermost House after spending a year immersed in the nature of the outer beach of East Ham. His account has been so revered in the world of nature writing that it was cited by the National Park Service under John F. Kennedy as a reason as to why the Great Beach needed to be preserved. As a veteran in 1923, Beston came to Cape Cod in search of peace and healing, relief from the debilitating trauma of the most violent of wars. He served in the First World War as an ambulance driver in France during the Battle of Verdun. Like many of those who have been in the heart of battle, he returned home scarred. You know, I, I work with some combat veterans saying that PTSD is the healthy response to a horrible situation. How do you come back completely whole after being in a horrible situation? Well, Henry comes back and he goes and lives out on Cape Cod and gets as far away as he can from humans for a while, but gets into the natural world and finds solace and healing and, and great beauty in the natural world. For Beston, the stresses of the war followed him to the Cape. While carrying the firewood, the memories of moving the wounded were still fresh. The booming sounds of the waves recalling the shots of the cannons. The light of the moon, a reminder of the flares over the wood. On the loneliest of nights, Beneath the blackened skies of France, with exploding torpedoes and landscapes littered with ripped bodies, I dreamt of my prim New England village. No thoughts, only longing. Only pictures of my long walks down the beach, searching for a hermit crab. He wrote two books about his World War I experiences. The first book, A Volunteer Parleau, offered incredibly horrifying details of what he was witnessing. He'd been closer to the carnage than most. His presence on the front lines was due to his ability to speak fluent French. What he saw was endless slaughter and indifference to human pain and suffering. He made a rather grim jest. All the American volunteers had a two-week crash course in identifying shells. At the end of the two weeks, those who passed the course went to the funeral of those who did not. He was profoundly affected by the memories of what had happened, what he had seen, what he had witnessed. In his words, a hideous peace atop a hideous war was scarce to be born. Violence becomes the commonplace. Shells, gases, and flames are the things that life is made of. The war is another lesson in the power of the species to adapt itself to circumstances. While in the trenches, the thoughts of home in New England were comforting. Upon his return home, it was the memories of the war that haunted him, despite his walks along the bucolic shores of Albert Cape Cod. 
As the road advanced into the wood, there was hardly a wayside tree that had not been struck by a shell. Branches hung dead from trees. Twigs had been lopped off by stray fragments. Great trunks were split apart as if by lightning. Nature as nature is never sinister. It is when there is a disturbance of the relations between nature and human life that you have the sinister. Here man is making nature unlivable for man. This will all end when the peasants plant again. In walking through the wood, a cut but with a little more than the trunk standing, we saw an object in the tree. We investigated and found pinned in a branch a human heart. Someone had been blown to bits and by a strange chance the heart had found lodgment in the tree. He hated war with a vengeance, and the political world that caused such conflicts. Brutal, destructive, innocent women and children being killed. But as the years went by, and when he thought more and more about what the Industrial Revolution was doing, he became very disillusioned with it, with war being a business, with the citizenry as stockholders. The more he got a little distance from the war, the more it started to haunt him. In 1919, Henry left the war with millions of other veterans. After the war, Henry sought to know and hear as little as he could. In search of a happy ending, Henry began writing books of fairy tales. But it wasn't until Beston's year on the Cape, still several years and several miles away, that the real healing process could begin. One of the great lessons that he learns or perhaps relearns from his experience there is that nature has a healing power. As Henry comes out to the Cape and starts reveling in, in nature, in part as a um, way of recovering from his wartime experiences, he really was looking for something that would uh, indicate that all was not lost. I mean, this is the era of the lost generation. When he goes to the Cape, one of the great lessons that he learns or perhaps relearns from his experience there is that nature has a healing power. Sun and moon rise here from the sea. The arched sky has an ocean vastness. The clouds are now of ocean, now of earth. The ocean besieged my door. North and north alone, I had touched with human beings. On its solitary dune, my house faced the four walls of the world. The dune land burns with the smell of sand, ocean, and sun. Solitary and elemental, unsullied and remote, visited and possessed by the outer sea, these sands might be the end or the beginning of a world.